Hi everyone, this is Jewish Talk coming to you from NASA Community College on 90.3 WHBC, also streaming on the iHeart and the iTunes app. This program is later archived on Spreaker.com. So, hi there, you know, you know the words. My name is Rabbi Pearl. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. This all depends on when you are listening or joining us. So, today I'd like to um, do a kind of a recap, a little bit about Hanukkah, a little bit about um, other aspects but in general, I just wanted to introduce myself in terms of saying thank you to each and every one of you during these rather unprecedented times. Uh, we, we've been able to come to you each and every week, thank God. And I want to say thank you to Kim and to Sean and everybody at WHBC for making the tremendous effort for us to be able to come to you on a weekly basis, despite all the restrictions and the, and the health conditions, etc. So I hope everyone is doing well. And that uh, the, the Hanukkah went well throughout the week. And um, we've left with more than just, you know, uh, uh, wax on the tables, but, but really some, uh, some really meaningful lessons and insights. So uh, with that in mind, I'd like to first begin with this um, story that really was, was quite a sensation uh, throughout the week, this past week. Let me let me tell you what ha- actually happened. It was a story that uh, w- that happened in uh, a faraway place. It was last week on the first night of Hanukkah, an Israeli uh, television station made a special holiday presentation through a live broadcast. They participated in a menorah lighting in Thai men in Siberia, no less led by the Chabad rabbi Yerachemiel Gorelik. They lit a 12-foot menorah made entirely out of ice. In order to construct it, they needed to cut a five-foot blocks of ice out of the frozen river. Once completed, it weighed over two and a half tons. Can you imagine? Two and a half tons. A day after the broadcast, the rabbi received a phone call from the local Protestant minister. He said that friends in Israel had told him about the ice menorah in that town. And they'd seen it on television. And he wanted to meet with the rabbi near the menorah. Later that day, they met up at the menorah's location. To the rabbi's surprise, the minister, this Protestant minister, went over to the menorah and gave it a kiss. This menorah is mine too, he said. Rabbi Gorelli was baffled. My grandfather, the minister explained, was Jewish too. Now the rabbi's ears perked up. Which grandmother, he said. Oh, my mother's mother. When Rabbi Gorelick told over the story, he noted in amusement that usually people come to the priest to confess, but this time the priest confessed to the rabbi. Amazingly, a menorah made of ice managed to kindle the flame in the minister's soul and inspired him to reveal his Jewish, his Judaism and his Jewishness publicly. Amazing story that I... That I came across this week, and we shared it on our many Zoom events. I want to tell you a similar story about the Baal Shem Tov. And when I was in camp as a child, I heard this story so many years ago, never thinking I would uh, chance upon it again, but here it goes. Shortly before he passed away, um, that, that is the Baal Shem Tov, his personal attendant turned to him with a question. Rebbe says, when you go to heaven, how will I support my family? How will I put food on my table? Ah, the Baal Shem says, don't worry. You served me so faithfully over the many years. Travel around and share your experiences. and You'll be able to support yourself from the proceeds. The Baal Shem soon passed away and the attendant purchased a horse and buggy and he set out on his way. He went from city to city, sharing stories and teachings of the Baal Shem but the results were really disappointing. Very little money came in. Weeks and months passed and he wandered from place to place. The entire time he was bothered by the question, where was the livelihood that he supposed to earn? What had happened to the Baal Shem Tov's promise? One day, he met up with a, another traveling preacher, and they were able to commiserate with each other. They had had their fair share of difficulties and failures in their unlucky profession. Suddenly, the, the preacher remembered something. In a certain city, 
he told the Baal Shem Tov's attendant, there's a wealthy man who loves stories of the Baal Shem Tov. He pays a handsome fee for each one. Why don't you travel there and share your experiences? The attendant didn't need to be told twice. He immediately hitched his horse and got on his way. He arrived at the wealthy man's home shortly before Shabbos. When he introduced himself, the man was overjoyed. You were the attendant, you were the assistant to the Baal Shem Tov. Wow, you'll be my honored guest. I will provide you with all your needs, but let's not waste time. Please, please tell me a story of the Baal Shem Tov. Settling down in the receiving room, the attendant opened up his mouth to share a story. To his shock and consternation, he couldn't remember a single one, a single story. His mind went completely blank. I'm a bit tired from the journey, he told his host. Allow me to rest a bit and I will share a story after the Shabbos dinner. That evening at the Shabbos table, the host once again asked him to tell a story. Again, he went black. He went blank. He racked his mind for a story, but couldn't come up with anything. Decades of work for the Baal Shem Tov seemed to have swallowed up by thin air. He couldn't remember anything. He was mortified. Guests at the table began to whisper that he was an imposter who had never met the Baal Shem Tov at all. The host, however, was more forgiving. Don't worry, he says, I'm sure you will have what to share tomorrow. The next day, the same scene repeated itself. Terribly ashamed, he impatiently waited for the end of Shabbos to escape, to get out of there. But then, several minutes before Shabbos was over, he suddenly remembered a story. Afraid he would forget it, he began to tell it immediately. So he told his story. Wow, he told his story. The ba- and this is the story. The Baal Shem Tov once asked me to join him on a journey. After a long, difficult trip, we arrived at the home of a Jewish villager, and the Baal Shem Tov asked if he could stay that night. To my surprise, the villager began to yell and cry, Please, I, please, I beg of you, he says, leave this village as soon as possible. As long as you are here, your life is in danger. Apparently, a famous pastor and apostate Jew who had converted was preaching that day in the city. The family expected him to fan the flames of anti-Semitism, and then the crowd's fervor would be directed at them, the only Jewish family in the area. The Baal Shem Tov calmed him down. Everything will be all right, he promised. Calmly, he stood at the window. The window was situated directly across the town square, when hundreds of peasants listened attentively to the the passionate address. The priest, a talented orator, looked around at his crowd, making eye contact with everyone present. Suddenly, I saw his eyes rest on the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov raised his hand and motioned to the, um, to the priest to come over to him. To my shock, the priest stopped everything, got off his podium and approached the window where he had a, hu- a hushed conversation with the Baal Shem Tov. I don't know what they, what they spoke, but when he got back onto the podium, he spoke well of the Jews and encouraged the populace to help them. I don't know what became of the priest, the attendant finished this story, but I witnessed this event with my own eyes. So this, this is the story. This is the story that he told this, this man. So the host thanked him warmly for the story. When the Shabbos was over, he went to his study and emerged with a, a bundle full of gold. This is my payment for your story, he said to the shocked attendant. It was a phenomenal amount of money, and the attendant has to take it. The host family was surprised as well. They knew he always paid for a story, but this sum was unprecedented. But the host insisted, take it, my friend, you've earned it. Let me tell you a story of my own, he explained. I was that priest. When the Malshemta spoke to me on that day, he rebuked me for inciting Siding against the Jewish community. Do you know how many, uh, how many sadly ha- Jews had been murdered because of you? He asked me. At that moment, I was moved to tears. I've done too much evil, I told him. I don't believe I have a path to repentance. The Baal Shem to promise me that every one of us can return to God. He even gave me a sign. When someone comes and retells the story of today's events, you will know that God has accepted your repentance. When you arrived at my home, I recognized you immediately. When I saw that you couldn't remember your stories, 
I realized that my teshuva was not yet complete. Throughout the Shabbos, I prayed and cried to God from the bottom of my heart to accept my regret. And now you've remembered the story. This sum of money is just a small portion of my wealth. Thank you for being the trusted messenger to tell me that my teshuva has now been accepted by the Almighty God. So, in this week's Torah portion, Yosef becomes the ruler of, the, of Egypt and a severe famine descends on the land. Back in Canaan, Jacob tells his sons, what, do you, what are you doing? I heard that there is a food in Egypt. At that point, they still had enough provisions to survive. However, Jacob didn't want his neighbors to believe and recognize that they had so much food. So he asked his sons to go to Egypt to purchase food like everybody else. Then the Torah says, an interesting note, and the brothers of Joseph, ten of them, went to acquire food in Egypt. Now, the commentators make two points. After, uh, first of all, the Torah calls them Yosef's brothers. Normally, they are called Yaakov's sons. But here, they're associated with Yosef, with Joseph. The reason, Rashi explains, is that they deeply regretted selling Yosef 17 years earlier and planned to use their trip to find him and bring him home. They were finally acting like Yosef's brothers. Second, the verse says that there were 10 of them. Why is that important information? We know that Binyamin remained home. We could reach the number of 10 on our own. Why was it so important to remember to mention the number? The Medish explains that 10 is a lucky number. A minion, a quorum of people have the power to nullify spiritual decrees. Abraham asked God to spare the people of Sodom if there were 10 righteous people in the city. The brothers understood that they had special powers as a group of 10 and they hoped that would assist them in their search for Yosef. Indeed, when they arrived in Egypt, they chose to enter through 10 separate gates. Why? to search for Yosef. The official reason for their trip was to purchase food, but their real intent was actually to find Joseph. And so, in last week's Parsha, Yaakov sent his son Yosef to search for his brothers. Remember that? He, he wandered in, 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 uh, in Shechem, that's, that's where it was all taking place, in Shechem, saying, I'm looking for my brothers. Has anyone seen them? Now, 22 years later, it was day who was searching for him. So, what we learn from this teaches us that the mission of our generation is like this. We must search for our missing brother, the long lost person, who may even just be a priest in Siberia, as I mentioned earlier on in the story. Just as the brothers ultimately found Yosef and Yaakov re was re reunited with his entire family, we can be sure that if we search out our long-lost brothers, we will be united as well with the coming of Mashiach. May it come very, very speedily. So you see, my friends, there are so many, so many insights and perspectives on how to look at the Torah portion and what it learns to us. Now, the, what's important to keep in mind when you read the story of Joseph and his brothers, that at some point, Yosef, Joseph, frames his brother, Benjamin. The terrible famine brought the ten of Jacob's sons in front of this viceroy to buy bread. The viceroy, who unbeknownst to them, was their brother Joseph, whom they had sold as a slave, accused them, what had happened there? He accused them of being spies and demanded they bring their brother Benjamin to Egypt. Before Joseph reveals his identity to his brothers, he frames Benjamin by planting his silver goblet in Benjamin's bag and charging Benjamin with theft. Judah now stands up for Benjamin, requesting that he himself be punished instead of Benjamin. Well, you know the rest of the story. At that point, Joseph then reveals his identity to his brothers and the extended family was reunited with Joseph in Egypt. Now, the conventional understanding is that the entire plot of Joseph and his brothers serves to explain how the Jewish people came to live in Egypt and how they eventually became enslaved to the Egyptians. So we're getting this unfolding story, how it happened, how we get that's the typical conventional way of understanding it. 
The Kabbalistic reading is precisely the opposite. Every step that Joseph took was in reality paving the way not for the eventual enslavement, but rather for the spiritual fortification of us in exile, which would ultimately lead to the redemption. So from a mystical perspective, in order for their descendants to survive the harsh exile, Joseph's brothers, who were the heads of the tribes of Israel, had to experience the oppression and the accusations of the Egyptian monarch, who, were, who was in turn their brother in disguise. When, like, their, like when, when all of us, like, their, like our ancestors before them, would feel subjected to the Egyptian monarch, they would remember, this is all laying out the foundation, they would remember the story of Joseph and realize that there was a deeper reality in play. The impressive monarch was really, in reality, their brother, who would ultimately bring benefit to them, which is, which is really part of the whole thing. The exile was a process that would refine them and lead them to great success. In addition to physical subjugation, exile also has a spiritual dimension. When we're in exile, we are not in our natural environment. We are living a life that is not consistent with our inner core, our natural, inherent awareness of God and connection to the spirituality of our inner soul is compromised. As our emotions and aspirations are directed exclusively to our physical survival, so all mostly involved with physical activities. And therefore, the whole story of Joseph and the brothers empowered us to overcome the spiritual numbness that does exist in exile. And the Torah describes how Joseph had Benjamin framed. Then he commanded the overseer of the house, saying, fill the man's sack with food, as much as they can carry, and put each man's money into the mouth of the sack. And my goblet, says Joseph, right, this is the, the key to the, our conversation, the silver goblet, put into the mouth of the sack of the youngest and his purchase money. And this is what they did. So according to the mystics, the silver goblet represents passion, passionate love and joy. The Hebrew word for silver, kesev, is the same word that means yearning and longing. The goblet contains wine, which, as the verse says, brings joy to the heart of man. So Joseph's planting the goblet in Benjamin's sack empowers us to realize that hidden within us is this goblet of wine, the capacity to have a loving, joyful relationship with Hashem. Joseph reminds us that we can dispel the darkness of exile by searching for the hidden reservoirs of positive emotions planted within us. When we discover the goblet and taste the wine, the spiritual exile dissolves, paving the way for a physical redemption as well. May it come very, very speedily. This is what we're learning today as we reflect on the Torah portion. So this is, my friends, some of the deeper insights to what we are doing today and sharing with you. So let's, let's uh, uh, continue our conversation. And if anybody would like to comment on our program, you're certainly welcome to uh, send me an email at rabbipearl at chabadminiola.com Rabbi Pearl at ChabadMiniola.com. So every every one of us, right? We've just come out of the holiday of Hanukkah. Every every child knows that the reason we celebrate the holiday, we're all familiar with the story of the miraculous jug of oil, how the Hashmanoim, Hasmoneans, entered the Holy Temple and found only one small jar of pure oil contained only enough for one day, and how a miracle happened and it burned for eight days. I'm sure we're all, you know, familiar with this. Now, the, um, as a remembrance of the miracle, the sages instituted the holiday of Hanukkah and the lighting of the candles. Now, arises that the question is that many miracles th occurred throughout Jewish history. Why did the sages institute a special holiday for this miracle, complete with Hallel prayers, when they didn't establish holidays to commemorate any other miracles? For example, many of you may be um, familiar with the story of the conquest of Jericho or Yericho. The book of Joshua tells us that when the Jewish nation stood at the brink of the conquering 
Jericho, God tells Joshua to walk around the city once, city walls once every day, together with the Aaron, the Ark of Covenant, and, the, and seven Kohanim blowing shofars. And this is what they did. They started on Sunday and continued for seven days. On the seventh day, which was Shabbos, they circled the city seven times. And, the, and, and at the seventh time, they sounded the shofars and the walls fell down. It was an, an awesome miracle that occurred before the entire, every in front of everybody. But does anyone know the exact date? I do not know myself. Joshua did not establish any holiday to remember this miracle. There's another lesson, lesser known miracle, which also involved Joshua. Several chapters later in the book of Joshua, we read about the battle of the five Amorite kings against the Jews. We are told that the battle occurred on Friday afternoon and that Joshua was afraid that the Jews would violate the Sabbath by fighting into the Sabbath. So he lifted his hands and prayed to Hashem and said, Before all of Israel, let the sun be subdued in Givon and the moon in Ayalon Valley. What happened? A miracle happened. For around 24 hours, the sun stopped in the sky and the moon stood still until the Jews concluded the, uh, the war. But has anyone ever heard of any sort of holiday establishing to remember this miraculous miracle? It's awesome. There's simply nothing. So why did this miracle happen? I, ha I happen to know that, uh, or I know when this actually happened, I happen to know the date is on the third day of Thomas. This actually happened on Kimmel Thomas, the, the Rebbe's yard site. So, um, but the bigger miracle, one which occurred for over 40 years while the Jews wandered the desert, right? The daily manna from heaven. Every day the manna helped. The manna came down, which was the Jewish nation's longest running miracle. All following miracles took mere moments or perhaps one night, like the splitting of the sea. The manna, however, came down daily for 40 years. And yet there is no holiday recalling this miracle. So this is our question. What's going on here? Perhaps this is a good thing. If we celebrated every miracle in Jewish history, virtually every day would be a holiday. So now we are back to the first question. Why did the sages see it fit to celebrate the miraculous jug of oil more than any other miracles? In Jewish history, we know of another famous miracle involving a flame not consuming its fuel, similarly to the oil from the jug not running out. Which miracle was that? You're right, the burning bush. When God revealed himself to Moses for the first time, the God the Torah tells us, he saw the burning bush and the bush wasn't being consumed. Moshe Rabbeinu saw a shrub, very susceptible to fire and easy to burn, burning, but not being consumed by the fire. This caused him to come closer. It was then that God revealed himself for the first time. But if God wanted to speak to Moses, why did he need to stage such a strange miracle? He simply could have revealed himself to Moses in a prophecy, just like he did with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the way back to Noah and Adam. He simply could have come to Moshe in a vision or a dream and have said the exact same thing at the burning bush. And the Medish explains why did God appear to Moses in this manner? Because in his heart, Moses felt that perhaps the Egyptians were annihilating us so God showed him a burning bush, but not being consumed. God was saying to him, just like the burning bush is a flame, but it's not being consumed, so too the Egyptians are unable to consume us. In doing this, God gave Moses and the entire Jewish people for all generations a message of encouragement and strength. Too many times it seems that the fires have ignited the Jewish people and that we fear what will happen to us. It is then that we remember the burning bush the bush that never was consumed. And there's no fire in the world that can extinguish anything that relates to, to uh, the Jewish people. And this is, my friends, the, um, this style. This style of miracle happened several times in Jewish history. The first was with Abraham when he was cast into the fiery furnace but was unburnt. Thus, the first Abraham proved that fire cannot harm us. There's another miracle that everyone knows from their local synagogues. In every synagogue above the ark, there's a ner tamid, light that remains constantly lit. 
Where did this custom come from? In the base of Mignosh, in the temple, the seven branch menorah was lit every night. It would be filled with enough oil to burn through the night. Despite this, in the morning, when all the other candles had burnt out, one candle remained kindled and miraculously burnt throughout the day. The Ner Hamaravi, the westernmost candle. This miracle occurred in both the first and second temples. Additionally, there was a miracle of fire that burnt on the altar. As we know, it continuously burnt. The concept of the flame burning but failing to consume the fuel is seen in the Hanukkah miracle. That's what makes this miracle so special. The candles burnt for eight days but still didn't succeed in consuming the oil which symbolizes the soul. We might say that the reason the sages chose to mark this particular miracle and not others is because it was really not a one-time miracle but rather a miracle that continues to this very day. No matter how many nations and governments try to burn down, as we all know what our history has shown, we remember Hasne Enem Ukal, the bush is not consumed. We continue and uh, to, 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 to go stronger and more powerful. And may Hashem bless us that the entire world very speedily will see the coming of Mashiach. And there won't need to be these kinds of miracles because everybody will appreciate the roles each and every one of us has. This is your host, Rabbi Pearl, wishing you a wonderful week. Stay safe and only good news. Thanks again. One, two, three, four.